All right, well, good morning. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and welcome you to our Janet L. Norwood Award Ceremony. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Charity Morgan. I'm an associate professor and the vice chair of education for the Department of Biostatistics here at UAB. I'm also the chair of the Janet L. Norwood Award Committee. Today, we recognize the recipient of the 21st annual Janet L. Norwood Award for outstanding achievement by a woman in the statistical sciences, as well as this year's recipient of the Charles R. Catholi Distinguished Dissertation Award. Um, just a note, in 2020 and 2021, we held this award ceremony virtually, and this is the first time we are back in person since the pandemic, so thanks for coming. So because of this, we've brought back the Catholi Award recipients from 2020 and 2021 to be recognized, uh, as well as this year's recipient. On that note, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Chichi Aban to present the Catholi Award. Good morning, everyone. And Again, if you don't know me, I'm Chi Chi Aben. I'm a professor in biostatistics. And it is my great pleasure to um, talk about the Catholi Award and also to give the uh, uh, Catholi Award to the, this year's um, recipient as well as recognize the last two years' recipients. So the Catholi Award started in 2008. So this is now our 15th year of doing the Catholi Award and is to recognize accomplished graduate student in our doctoral program. Um, and more importantly, also to honor um, our beloved Professor Chuck Catholi, Charles, we fondly call him as Chuck. Um, and just to give you a background on um, Dr. Catholi, he is, um, he has contributed a lot to the department. He has a lot of history um, of the department because he started at UAB in the Department of Biomathematics and also Biostatistics then in ninth, since 1970. So he has been here for a while and have seen a lot of um, changes and evolution to the department. I just was just talking to him and he said that he He's actually working and putting together a history of the department, which I think is going to be great um, for us all to know um, how it all started. Um, he was previously the chair of the department and has been the prof a professor emeritus since 2003, but has been very active in teaching and research even after retiring. So. A lot of people are changing the definition of retirement, and that includes Chuck. Um, over the years, you can see how much he loves teaching. I mean, really, his dedication in teaching. Um, he loves to share his knowledge to the students, and because of that, students respect him a lot. And he has, um, you know, he's very accessible to the student, not just inside the classroom as well as outside the classroom. He has been mentors to a lot of students. He has been mentors to us faculty members and has been a great friend to a lot of us. Um, definitely has a lasting impact in many people and it's just too many things to list all the things that he has achieved in the department. Um, if you don't know him yet, especially the new students, please feel free to drop by his office. He's still there every day. And um, you will probably, the doctoral students will be seeing him in advance inference next year, so, or next fall, uh, spring. So, so that would be a, a great honor for you to be um, in his class. Um, so it is truly an honor to be presenting this award to pay, pay tribute to Dr. Catholi, um, a great educator, mentor, and a very dear friend. So now I'm going to present the 2022 recipient of the Charles R. Catholi Distinguished Dissertation Award. And this year it goes to Dr. Boyigo. His dissertation is titled Spike and Slab Additive Models and Subscalable uh, Algorithms for High Dimensional Data Analysis. And the chair is Dr. Nanjin Yi. I don't know if he's here. Um, just to give you some background on Dr. Guo, 
He joined the doctoral program of our department in the fall of 2017. Um, he came with a master's in statistics from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And while at UAB, Boye has just been very active in school organizations, department activities. He has been mentoring um, doctoral students. So, you know, he's been great contributor to the department and a great student. Uh, so, and, but what I saw in um, another interesting thing that I saw in Boye's um, CV is probably, I don't know you know, but he's a member of the University of Illinois rowing team. <laughs> so you should show us how to do rowing next time. But it is really my great pleasure and the department's pleasure to um, present this award to Dr. Boy Go. And as what uh, Dr. Morgan said, we are also here to um, recognize the uh, recipients of the uh, Catholic, Dr. Catholic dissertation award for the last two years because we had them only on um, online. So now we're going to have them in person. From last year, we have Dr. Ruba Shaheen. And her dissertation is about the likelihood-based inferential methods to analyze hybrid clinical trials. And 2020 recipient is Dr. Justin Leach. And his dissertation is on incorporating spatial structure into Bayesian variable selection using spike and slab priors with application in imaging data. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morgan. Before we present this year's recipient of the Jenna L. Norwood Award, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who Dr. Norwood was and why we have honored her with this award since 2002. Jenna L. Norwood was appointed to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics by President Jimmy Carter in 1979, when she became the first female commissioner of the Bureau. She headed this agency for 13 years and served under four U.S. presidents. She testified 137 times before Congress, stood up to presidents, and had a reputation for being objective, methodical, and unflappable. She once said, I believe strongly that an objective, scientifically created system of data is essential for a democracy to flourish. At the Bureau of Labor Statistics, she oversaw almost 3,000 employees, championing them and encouraging them to conduct independent research, creating what she called, quote, a cognitive laboratory within the Bureau. She once said, what I always tried to do was to get people to do what I thought they ought to be doing because they wanted to do it. Norwood brought the National Longitudinal Survey to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and developed the Quarterly Employment Cost Index. In this action, she embodied the principles of statistical science and methodology. She, had a, she advocated for the use of social and behavioral science in defining economic indicators. She had a particular interest in the measurement of race in the U.S. Census and the implications of undercounting racial and ethnic minorities. Janet Norman was once quoted as saying, we, we are responsible for some of the most sensitive data of the economic data. These data figure very prominently in most of the political debates, so it is extremely important that they be accurate and of high quality. She knew that as statisticians, our work has the potential to change the world, and she understood the importance of objectivity and statistical rigor. Janet Norman was a fellow of the American Statistical Association and an honorary fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. In 2015, she was inducted into the Department of Labor's Hall of Honor, and the Conference Center at the Bureau of Labor Statistics was renamed for her as the Janet L. Norwood Conference and Training Center. She passed away in 2015 at the age of 91. The UAB Department of Biostatistics gives this award each year to not only recognize Dr. Norwood's achievements, but also to recognize the contribution of all women to the statistical sciences. 
At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Anastasia Hartzis to introduce this year's Norwood Award recipient. It is my pleasure to introduce the recipient of this year's Janet L. Norwood Award, Dr. Susan Halabi. Dr. Halabi comes to us from Duke University's Medical Center, where she is the Chief of the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. Dr. Halabi received a PhD in biometry from the School of Public Health at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. She joined the faculty at the Tulane University, becoming an associate professor in 1994 before moving on to Duke University's Medical Center in 1996. She became an associate professor in 2010 and then full professor in 2012. Dr. Halabi began serving as co-chief of the department in 2019 before finally becoming department chair this year. Dr. Halabi's work in statistical methodology has been recognized internationally, particularly with her efforts in clinical trial design and genitourinary oncology research. In particular, she developed an especially useful prognostic model predicting survival in men with prostate cancer. This model is often called the Halabi nomogram and has advanced not only clinical practice guidelines, but also prospective clinical trials. Some of the other areas benefiting from her contribution include genomic predictive models for clinical outcomes and health disparities in oncology patients. She has authored over 200 publications, contributed chapters to many, to many books, and edited three books on clinical trial design. In addition to her many research-related roles, she has also been training oncology researchers and mentoring students and early career faculty. We on the Janet Norwood Committee were particularly moved by her enthusiasm of her nominators, who were emphatic in indicating her passion and contributions to the field and her encouragement to those that she mentors. In a truly demonstrative act of her commitment to support training for future statisticians and researchers, Dr. Halabi donated all proceeds from a book that she edited to support this goal. We are not alone in recognizing Dr. Halabi's contributions to research and statistics. Not only is she a fellow of the Society of Clinical Trials and the American Statistical Association, she was, the first female, she was the first female statistician to be elected to, as a fellow of the American Society of Medical Oncology. Dr. Halabi has also served as the president of the Society for Clinical Trials and last year was honored with the American Statistical Association's Statistical Partners in Academia, Industry, and Government Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Halabi. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I would like to take a moment and uh, thank you, AB, for uh, having me. This is, uh, I'm humbled by the award. Um, and I would like to thank uh, my nominator, Dr. Virginia Howard, and uh, the committee for their uh, efforts in uh, looking at um, uh, potential nominees. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Charity Morgan, Dr. Anastasia Hartz, and, um, and I'm really delighted. I spent yesterday afternoon at UAB, and I'm impressed by the School of Public Health. Uh, public Health has been my love from day one, and I'm just impressed by all the things, the university and the commitment of School of Public Health to students. You are the future. You are the future of public health. You are the future of medicine. So what I'm going to start uh, by saying uh, here, uh, acknowledging the prior Janet L. Norwood Award recipients. I'm the 21st. But as you can see from this enormous, prestigious list of statisticians, no two are the same. Everyone is unique. Everyone is bringing their strength and their talents. This is very important. So thank you, Janet. Al Norwood for being a pioneer to follow in your footsteps. And thank you, UAB, for having this award. And special thanks to David Wilson, Dr. David Wilson, who's, who established this award. And I want to take a moment and thank my parents, who uh, ingrained in me at a very young age the importance of education and were very supportive. And my husband, who has been there behind me, behind every 
successful woman, there is a man, and there are several women. So this is very important to note. And I would like to take a moment to thank my advisor at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, Dr. Huda Zre, who was my first advisor. I was in the first cohort of biostatisticians who earned a bachelor's degree in biostatistics. And in UT, I would like to acknowledge Lem, Dr. Lem Waye, Dr. Barry Davis, who served as my advisors on the master's and the PhD committees, and Dr. Margaret Spitz and Melissa Bondi at the UTMD Anderson, who served also as the role model. So as you can see, there were many, many people on this journey that I have to thank, and I probably will take a whole hour thanking everyone. While I was at Tulane, I met enormous women, uh, Dr. Ruth Gise, Dr. Janet Hughes, Dr. Richard Davis, and at Duke, when I first started my career, Dr. Barbara Reimer and Dr. Joellen Schulkraut. So you could note that those women, they're not all statisticians. I've worked with epidemiologists, I've worked with clinicians, I've worked with um, basic scientists, and these are the advocates, these are the faces of advocates that keep supporting you. And sometimes those advocates you develop not only in school, it could be while you're serving on a study section or being a reviewer for a journal. There's always unexpected things happening. And I'm really grateful for all the people who put me today because the opportunities came and they encouraged me at every step of the way. So as women, we face a lot of challenges. How do you balance work life? This was highlighted during the COVID pandemic. Women ended up paying a higher price than men. They had to, uh, some women had to drop their careers. There's issues in equal pay in 21st century United States, women are not paid the same as men. There is an issue of childcare. How do we navigate all that? And as uh, Janet Norwood said, women have to take advantage of the opportunities presented to them. It's often is not, isn't quite as straight a career path at, as it is for men. So you have all these barriers, gender bias, Tactics, women may be less assertive. There are structural barriers, limited access to network or female network, family responsibilities, and child care. And I want to say an, a really important quote here that uh, Janet Norwood mentioned. I think for a married woman to have a career, she needs to have a husband who is very secure and not competitive with her. So this is really important. So how do we overcome challenges as a woman? Again, this is from my personal experience. Commitment and discipline are the paving stones of progress. We all work very hard, and it's so easy to give up. But every time a grant is rejected or a paper, after 24 hours of cooling period, pick up the pieces and continue. You don't give up. Seek mentors. Mentors are all around us. We don't think of our colleagues as mentors. We don't think sometimes of our reviewers or editors, but mentors come from every aspect and not necessarily dis our discipline. You may develop career building relationships. I have still excellent relationships with my mentors that I've met 20 years ago, and I hope to continue until the very end. Uh, I think the fourth point is so important. We need to pursue opportunities rather than wait for them. We are always presented with opportunities, but we're overwhelmed with our current responsibilities, and we always say, we'll do it later, I'll think about it. And I'm sure all of us have experienced that. Now, from this slide onward, I'm going to talk about clinical trials because, as uh, both Dr. Morgan and Dr. Hartzis mentioned, I spent pretty much my entire career in clinical trials. And that was a big shift because I moved from a school of public health, which was at Tulane University, to a school of medicine. So then that was the focus. 
And when I first started working, there was this notion that if you have no biomarker, you're not going to have a clinical trial in cancer. So uh, just to, stay, to set the record straight, I'm going to just define quickly what's meant by a biomarker, or sometimes people refer to it as a molecular marker. It is something that's measured, hopefully objectively, not always objectively. It's an indicator of a normal biological or abnormal processes, and it could come from any specimens from the uh, patient. It could be tissue, serum, urine, or radiographic. And the key question is, if we have some information on a biomarker and we know we have a hypothesis a priori that uh, patients who are positive on a biomarker are more likely to respond than negative patients, then should we not, as scientists, integrate that in our clinical trial design? And I will touch on the second point. Asking the right questions is so important these days because when we talk about precision medicine, we want to know whom to treat, what to treat, and when to treat. So in, t in cancer, uh, this idea of targeted therapies uh, had been uh, around for a long period, I would say probably for the past two decades. Targeted therapies are therapies that are designed to block a certain pathway or mutation. And uh, the important thing is targeted therapy is assumed a priori to work in patients with a special target. And this is uh, the type of trials that were done like almost two decades ago. So this is an enriched design where uh, this is a trial that took place in Japan. And they had to um, screen over 3,800 patients. And only those who were positive with HER2 um, were uh, randomized those patients who were negative were not. And as you could see, that uh, that was 15% of the total patients who were screened. So those patients who were positive uh, with gastric cancer were randomized to either the standard of care or standard of care plus trastuzumab, which is a targeted therapy. So that was the hypothesis. And then, lo and behold, these are the results from the trial. Very nice, uh, clear Kaplan Meier curve showing separation in overall survival and demonstrating the drugs work with a hazard ratio of 0.74 and a highly uh, statistically significant p value. So, these are the trials that were done in 2010. And then we thought, okay, uh, let's do be, become more efficient, let's use more newer designs. And then we started seeing designs called the umbrella designs. Uh, again, this is, my focus is on cancer because this is what I've pretty much spent the past 20 years, uh, 20 plus years working on. So uh, umbrella trial, a very successful trial, is the lung map that's run by the SWOG, the Southwest Oncology Group. And then what you could see here within each of uh, those columns, you have basically separate studies conducted under one umbrella called one study called lung map. So like you look at a certain biomarker and based on that, you will um, <clears throat> randomize patient to either a targeted therapy or standard of care. And this trial is still ongoing and has been successful and led to the approval of certain drugs in men and women who had lung cancer. Now, one, uh, there are obviously several factors that might affect the criteria for success of these trials, um, and that's based on, first of all, actionable targets should be known. Uh, the other important criteria is the prevalence. The prevalence of the biomarker should be moderate to high, otherwise the trial is going to fail. And then obviously we need to have a cutoff for the binary 
uh, for the biomarker. Now, a lot of these biomarkers are measured on a continuous scale, and you cannot use them in a trial, so you need to validate the cut cutoff point, and they're, in essence, going to be uh, deemed as binary. But despite those advances, we still face challenges. So we used first uh, targeted therapies, then we moved to umbrella trials. Uh, we found out that the tumors originating in the same tissue organs are genetically heterogene heterogeneous. So we found that there is heterogeneity within patients and across patients. And more importantly, what's happening was the patients were becoming resistant to drugs. So you treat patients, you treat prostate cancer patients with and androgen inhibitors, um, uh, therapies, and then after two or three years, they become resistant to the drug. So now we have a new set of problems. So this led us, of course, to precision medicine. And as I've demonstrated, the whole notion has been there. But of course, with President Obama, he made this happen. So we're looking at tailoring of medical treatments to individual characteristics of each patient. And here, when we talk about individual characteristics, we're focusing on a biomarker or a mutation. So we're looking at biological um, characteristics of patients. And in the hope that we can optimize therapy, can we focus as a scientific community on finding the patients who will benefit from that treatment, but at the same time minimize their adverse effect. So definitely we want to look at efficient uh, designs. And then of course, with the introduction of all the omics, whether you look at DNA, RNA, images, uh, uh, single cell uh, uh, data, whether you look at microbiome, all that data, we have massive data sitting there, and then we have a lot of experts in artificial intelligence and machine learning trying to bring that to uh, clinical trials. So um, you may know what basket trials are, but they are um, uh, trials that are uh, usually designed to estimate drug activity. They usually have very small sample sizes. And what's different, uh, those trials, like you could have a basket trial where you have different cancer type. When I talk about histology, this is the cancer site or the type. And then uh, regardless of what histology you have, if all of those patients have the same mutation, you're going to treat them with the same drug. A very good example is BRCA1 and BRCA2. So you have patients in breast cancer or ovarian cancer or prostate cancer, and they all have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. So you can have a hypothesis. You're going to treat those patients with PARP inhibitors because this is based on real-world evidence. And I'll come back to this point. So then we designed um, this trial called the TAPER uh, trial, which is the targeted agent profile utilization registry trial, which we can think of it as a super umbrella, because what we did, we took the histology, we took a specific variant, and we treated those patients with a specific treatment. We took another histology, with a different variant, and we treated those patients with also another treatment. And then we continued along the way. So actually, this study is, um, I would say, the largest basket trial that I know to date. It had enrolled 593 cohorts, where every cohort is composed of histology, variant and a certain drug that's been treated with over uh, 2493 patients. And the primary endpoint, uh, from a statistical point of view, the trial is really simple. It's a, it's a phase two trial. We use Simon Optimal Design and we use a primary endpoint of clinical benefit rate, which is defined as either complete or partial response at eight weeks or stable disease at 16 weeks. 
So that was an example of a phase two, but let's look at what's happening now in medicine. Right now, they are conducting trials where they're looking not only at one marker, but they're looking at uh, several markers at the same time. And uh, this study was presented last February at a national meeting. It's the magnitude trial where they took patients uh, with prostate cancer who had homologous recombination repair and based on their biomarker status, they randomized them to either a PARP inhibitor or not. And uh, lo and behold, here are the result uh, from the trial based on the uh, primary endpoint, which is radiographic progression-free survival. And then in patients who had BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, you could see a very wide separation uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.53. So you say, wow, this is impressive. Like, where are we going to evolve from here? Well, there is a big problem happening in the clinical trials world. And this is they're not enrolling enough patients that represent the U.S. population. And this is especially true, I can at least attest, for oncology trials. So we looked at a lot of the studies and we've noticed there was a, a, a very low enrollment of minorities. Uh, and uh, there, there's been uh, this debate that's ongoing, like is this health disparities in minority due to access to health care or is it due to biology or is it due to both? And there has been some evidence that you have health disparities in breast, prostate, colorectal, stomach, and cervical cancer. But you know, this is an area that's very complicated because you have to look at the social determinants of health. We cannot, this is where the School of Public Health can do great work. I think uh, investigators in the School of Medicine are lagging behind uh, in terms of social determinants of health. And uh, I looked, I was very much interested actually the first time I looked at using clinical trials data, I was going to ask these questions. Do African-American men who are enrolled in clinical trials that I've been designing, do they have worse outcome or not? So we know based on the C registry that the incidence and mortality is much higher, much, much higher in uh, African-American men than white men. But then when I looked at the data, there was really no differences. And I was perplexed. So the first time I did the, this kind of analysis was in 2010. And I submitted the, the article to several journals and everyone would, <laughs> would reject that article. And the reason, because we did not know why we see these differences. Even when we adjusted the hazard ratio, for important factors that were measured, African-American men appeared to do better, but I wasn't convinced. And I'll tell you why. So when we looked at the distribution of uh, the prostate cancer patient by racial groups, uh, th this is the distribution. So you could see that African-American men were only 6%, Asian men 5%. And 4% were others. Actually, in many of those clinical trials were conducted globally, so race, ethnicity was not captured. And how do you analyze data when you bring in global trials in the mix with US conducted trials? So then we stratified by the type of sponsor. So we looked at the National Cancer Institute, National Clinical Trials Network. And then we noticed that uh, there was a better representation of African-American men in those prostate cancer trials that I analyzed versus industry, which is only 4%. Now, of course, this is only prostate cancer. So the question comes up, well, what about other cancers? So I had access, uh, this is unpublished data from the the NCI National Clinical Trials Network. This is based on 53,689 patients. 
And this is the distribution by race. And as you could see, uh, Asian, it's below uh, what the U.S. population is. African-American, the projected U.S. population is 12.6. Uh, American Indian is 1.3. So for every racial group, with the exception of native, Hawaiian Pacific Islander, and whites, the enrollment was much, much, much lower. This is the 21st century. How can we accept that? And then it looks even worse when you look by Latino, uh, we enrolled only collectively 7% when the U.S. population is 18. So there are obviously challenges, global challenges, because only 3% of cancer patients participates in clinical trial. There's always a hate of placebo, and in oncology trial, everybody loves to use placebo because it's a low bar. Right? Drug companies can zoom very quickly, they can demonstrate benefit. But there's also other reasons, lack of awareness about clinical trials. Also, there's up to 40% of oncology trials, uh, trials are not completed due to poor accrual. But uh, here I'm going to share with you some daunting statistic about oncology facts and figures. So in 2022, there were only 13,365 hematology oncologists in the U.S. 35, almost 36 percent were women. 22 percent are over 64, are really uh, approaching retirement age. And we know the cancer incidence will increase by 45 percent by 2030. And then when we look at the oncologist, uh, again, this is from the State of Cancer Care in America report uh, by the American Society of Clinical Oncology, only 3% of practicing oncologists were identified themselves as African American, 4.7% as Hispanic, and 0.1% as American Indian or Alaska Native. So when you look even further, uh, when you look at the Hispanic, it's 4% are oncologists versus the cases every year of new cancer is 9.3%. And then when you look at the Association of American Medical College reports, it doesn't look better. Like you say, we're going to um, train the, and develop the pipeline but it doesn't look really much better uh, when we look at uh, the representation, whether oncologists who are practicing or uh, those students who've been uh, matriculants to U.S. schools. You can see that maybe we're better than a few years be before, but we haven't really reached where we need to do. So definitely there's underrepresentation, uh, underrepresented um, and the representation of minorities, whether you're looking African American or Hispanic, in uh, medical schools. And then uh, the other point to bring up here is I haven't talked about poverty. If we go back to um, this slide, there are only 10%, 10.5% of oncologists are uh, in rural areas. So then how are we going to? enroll more patients? How can we be more inclusive? How can we find cure? These are really important questions and challenging ones. I don't pretend that I have an answer to any of those. But we know that odds of clinical trial participation goes very down, much, much lower participation for patients with lower income. So there are many barriers. Some of them are the awareness, some of them are opportunities, but I think a big part is mistrust and fear and discomfort and time, and there may be uh, other reasons uh, related to providers. So when we did um, this trial, we went ahead and conducted a trial where we recruited 100 patients at 10 sites it took a long time 
because we wanted to recruit 50 African-American men and 50 white men. And we wanted to show whether the results that I have uh, analyzed from retrospective data were correct or not, because I wasn't convinced is this bias. Because even though everyone is getting treatment, so we eliminated access to health care, we're not sure if the patients, the African-American patients, represent the African-American patients on a whole. Otherwise, our estimates will not uh, show better survival and overall survival. But in any case, we were successful in doing this trial. I mean, there were um, coordinators. We worked with, uh, we engaged the community. I mean, this demonstrates if someone budgets the effort, we can do that. And then going back to the taper uh, trial that's conducted by ASCO, they've been incredible. This is the sixth year of, the t of this uh, big basket trial. And in the beginning, they were not enrolling sufficient African-American men and other minorities. Then they uh, uh, increased their size. They brought in oncologists who, can, uh, who were working diligently with the community to enroll them. And you can see that, okay, we're not at 13%. We're getting there with African-American men. The Asian were doing very well. Um, and then the American Indian were still lagging behind. Uh, and the same thing with Hispanic Latino, but however, they just added few sites uh, in Miami and Puerto Rico. So we know the enrollment is gonna go up. But, but this is the conundrum we're gonna face when we do precision medicine. We're not gonna have enough patients. We're gonna have to look at, for those patients with either mutations or certain biomarker and then what can we do as clinical trialists? Well, the good thing is the FDA recently released guidance on real-world evidence. And we know from the Food Drug uh, Cosmetic Act, Section 505D, that we need to demonstrate substantial evidence, which means evidence consisting of adequate and well-controlled investigation. So this is what uh, FDA and the advisor will look at the data, and you want to show substantial evidence. And historically, the regulators uh, only applied that to clinical trials, but not to observational studies. So the good thing is we have these guidance on real-world data, and uh, there have been since 2017 at least three or four drugs that were approved with um, data from real world data. So this is something that could be done. And we actually faced that when we were doing the taper. So what we did, uh, there were two other international trials ongoing, one in Canada called Capture and the other one is Droop in the Netherlands. And they were designed exactly the same way as TAPER. So they took our protocol and they said they're doing the same study but in different population. And then we uh, ended up having, uh, we spent like two years writing a protocol where we're trying to combine data, but we're combining data while the trial is ongoing. So we're doing near real time data um, analysis, and this is referred to as Tadruka for taper, droop, and capture. And as you could see, you, you can probably not see this heat map. This is an example of, um, uh, let me go over here for a minute. Uh, so these on the uh, y-axis are uh, the uh, mutations, as you can see, this is all the po potential mutations, and these are the cancer types, but all these patients are treated with prestuzumab and trastuzumab. And you can see that when we combine data across the three studies, we end up with sufficient numbers that we'll be able to test the primary hypothesis. So our target was 20 patients, and we could see that for patients who have ERBB2 or the HER2 mutation, uh, patients with lung cancer and colorectal cancer, we have hope of uh, really testing that hypothesis. 
So what's the implication for precision medicine? Because this has a lot of implication. We cannot treat everyone uh, while we would like to treat everyone based on their mutation. We're not going to have enough patients. And uh, as uh, Janet Norwood said, I will say this again, I believe strongly that an objective, scientifically created system of data is essential for a democracy to flourish. When we look at existing databases, whether uh, the GWAS data, they're mostly done in European, uh, in white European, like 95%. So the data doesn't exist. And I think uh, we need, first of all, to uh, put resources to collect data because the data that's existing right now is not representative of the diverse population. Also, there is a, a big uh, here a dilemma because when we talk about precision medicine, people think there are biological differences by race, but many, many of my investigators don't believe there are biological differences by race. They think there are differences due to structural racism. So definitely when we start looking at precision medicine and precision public health, we need to understand the health equities. You cannot just recruit patients in your trial without knowing everything that's going on with them. So uh, I would say any data analysis that's based on these databases will probably be biased, including my study. All I can say that the patients who were enrolled on those trials did better, but they do not represent the general population. And the patients who enrolled on those prostate cancer trials had access to care. So we eliminated that big, big barrier. And I would like to end the next few slides on a very nice quote by uh, Dr. Otis Brawley, who is now at uh, Johns Hopkins, which I think is, uh, it sums up my whole philosophy. It should not be forgotten that a large body of literature demonstrates that the poor, including white, blacks, whites, and persons of other races are less likely to receive optimal medical care. We must not overemphasize biological differences between races as reasons for disparities. I think this is an easy way out. I hear people saying all the time it's due to biology. Well, maybe. Maybe it's due to biology and the interaction of uh, access to health care and all the factors that are part of the social determinants of health. Has anyone looked at that? Well, some people are looking at it now. So going back to Janet Norwood, for democracy to flourish, it is important to document. If we want to document health disparity, you have to have data. You cannot just eliminate a sector or sectors from the society. So it is important to document, understand, and address drivers of disparities. From trials conducted by NCI and CTN, so I'm focusing on NCI because they're the big funders here, and also we have to hold our industry partners as credible too. There should be multidisciplinary approach needed for enrolling higher number of underrepresented population, and I know you can do that. We have shown that in TAPER, we have shown in our phase two trial, yes, it takes longer, yes, you need more money, yes, you need to train more coordinators, but believe me, it's worth it. We need also to develop the pipeline for underrepresented oncologists. Mentoring and training programs are urgently needed at all levels, not only oncologists, fellows, students in medical schools. And then lastly, we want to have partners and collaboration across all the funders, whether it's NCI, NCTN, or industry, but we should uh, be seeking those partnership. And we should also treat our patients as partners and communicate those results to them at the end of the trial. Thank you very much for your attention.
So on behalf of the UAB Department of Biostatistics, I'm honored to present you with the Janet L. Norwood Award for Outstanding Achievement for Women in Statistical Sciences. Thank you so much. I'm deeply honored. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for attending, and I uh, hope the younger generation, you, our future is in, <laughs> is in your hands, so <laughs> uh, run with all those ideas. There's, um, I haven't had time to talk about what it means for a student in biostatistics or, or epidemiology. You have to learn biostatistics, you have to learn epidemiology, you have to learn biology. You ha I mean, you have to understand this essay, what, what is a mutation, what is the difference between amplification and deletion. Uh, you have to be part, an integral part of team science. This is becoming way more difficult than when I first started working as a statistician. Thank you all for attending my talk and having me. <laughs>